The U.S. Navy had been interested in the potential of nuclear power for its ships going all the way back to 1939, when a small research group had been experimenting with practical nuclear fission. But the research into power generation took a back seat as the United States was drugged into the Second World War. All nuclear research was directed to the Manhattan Project for the atomic bomb. But as soon as Japan surrendered in Tokyo Bay in August of 1945, the push to develop peaceful uses of nuclear power was in full swing. The U.S. Navy in particular had a person that was extremely driven to get the Navy a nuclear-powered ship. His name was Captain H.G. Rickover. He became the pioneer of the effort to build the world's first nuclear-powered submarine and would later be known as the father of the nuclear navy. There had never been a large-scale nuclear reactor built before, so the Navy built a test unit in Idaho to experiment with. Due to the urgency that the Navy placed on the project, the whole of the submarine was being built as the reactor research was actually taking place. The prototype pressurized water reactor in Idaho was built by Westinghouse and was called the Submarine Thermal Reactor, or STR Mark I. The STR Mark I was the land-based prototype and the STR Mark II would actually be the unit placed into the submarine. The Mark I was a test and development unit and was used to work out the bugs and flaws as well as train the crew that would operate the reactor on board the submarine. It achieved criticality in March of 1953 and made its first simulated voyage in June. The STR Mark II and most naval reactors afterwards were built to operate using highly enriched uranium-235 enriched to 90 plus percent. This was weapons grade uranium. This was done in order to maximize the amount of fissile fuel in the core as well as providing a long fuel life. Compare that to the uranium fuel rods in electrical power plant reactors which are only enriched between 1.5 and 4 percent. Since the STR Mark II used such highly enriched fuel, it only needed 9 pounds of uranium as its total fuel load. The fuel bundle assembly was about the size of a football, but this produced energy that was the equivalent to 5,760 tons of coal. The final result produced 10 megawatts of power and in turn powered two steam turbine engines that produced a combined 35,000 horsepower. The sub itself was authorized in 1951. The electric boat company was tasked with building the sub and the keel laid down for construction in 1952. It was finally launched in January 1954 and the maiden voyage of the ship was on January 17, 1955 where Commander Eugene Wilkinson made the historic message underway on nuclear power. In May of that year, the sub left Connecticut and headed south to Puerto Rico. It remained submerged for the entire trip of 1,381 miles and 89 hours, the longest submerged cruise to date ever performed by a submarine. The Nautilus had a crew of 105 and measured 320 feet long, 28 feet wide and had a draft of 26 feet, and had a top submerged speed of 23 knots, easily the fastest sub in the world. Its max dive depth was 700 feet and the vessel displaced 3,400 tons at the surface. The Nautilus had a few mishaps during its early operation period, like a steam pipe rupturing filling the vessel full of steam. Luckily it didn't involve anything radioactive. This was clean water used to cool the reactor, but during the investigation they realized that seamless pipe had not been used as was specified by design, so all the cooling lines had to be replaced with seamless pipe. Eight months later, another water leak from a pipe forced the sub to return to port early for repairs, but the issue was very minor and again did not involve any radioactive water. On April 22, 1956, the Nautilus was snagged by a fishing boat's net about 140 miles off the coast of New Jersey while cruising at a depth of 150 feet. The sub almost drugged the fishing boat underwater, but the crew didn't even notice they were dragging the boat and continued cruising along all the way to Groton, Connecticut. The estimated damages to each vessel was $1,300. Then, six days later, while being repaired, the vessel suffers fire damage that was caused by a welding horse during repairs. They accidentally caught something on fire next to the ship, which didn't damage a whole lot, but it did burn a section of paint off the hull. The Nautilus was the first vessel to ever transverse the North Pole by sea. The mission took three tries to complete. While the sub was submerged, there was no communication or navigation aids with the outside world. There were also a few sea charts of the Arctic Ocean. 
On the first attempt in August of 1957, the Nautilus became lost due to failures of navigational equipment and ultimately had to turn around and head back. Also during this attempt, two periscopes were damaged while rising under the pack ice. The Nautilus returned back to open sea and surfaced and attempted to repair the damaged periscopes themselves. After 12 hours in rough seas, freezing temps, and gale force wind, the crew was able to manage one repair, but the other one was damaged beyond their scope of being able to fix it, so they had to return to port. During this time period, the Nautilus had very basic navigational aids, basically a gyroscope compass and magnetic compass, both of which do not work very well near the, near the North Pole. This was decided to be an issue that needed to be fixed. So, after the failure of his first attempt, the Navy decided to install a new navigational system in the sub. They had a system called the N6A1, and it was an internal system that was originally developed for Navajo cruise missiles. But there were doubts that it would work for the sub due to the fact that missiles travel very fast for very short periods of time, and the sub traveled very slow for very long periods of time. But after it was installed and they tested it, it actually turned out to work really well and was quite reliable. Again, in April 1958, under the code name Project Sunshine, the Nautilus would attempt to reach the pole again. The Nautilus headed out of Groton, Connecticut and headed south towards the Panama Canal. Shortly after setting sail, though, a small salt water leak began inside of one of the steam condensers. After passing through the Panama Canal and experiencing a fire from an oil-soaked turbine insulation, on May the 4th, the Nautilus puts into Moore Island shipyard in San Francisco for repairs. The source of the leak can't be found, so the Nautilus heads out to Seattle, and during the trip, the captain decides to use the same type of stop leak fluid you can use in your car radiator to try and repair the leak in the condenser unit. <laughs> so when, you, when they got to Seattle, they sent a couple guys ashore, and they bought 140 quarts of radiator stop leak. They poured half of the stop leak into the condenser system, and the, the leak actually stopped, and they continued their mission. After this, they returned to sea in their attempt to reach the North Pole. However, it was the ice that stopped them in, Chuck, in the Chucky Sea. The ice was thick, and the water was shallow, blocking their path into the Arctic Ocean. But in August of 1958, they sailed out of Pearl Harbor and finally found a safe path into the Arctic Ocean near Point Barrow, Alaska, and they reached the North Pole. Their position log read latitude 90, longitude indefinite. From here they sailed towards Greenland's northeast coast and then surfaced after being under the ice for 1,590 miles and 96 hours. Once underway again, the Nautilus sailed to the Isle of Portland, England before crossing the Atlantic and arriving back in his home port of New London, Connecticut on October the 29th. The crew received a presidential unit citation, the first ever issued in peacetime, and Commander William R. Anderson received a Legion of Merit, which was personally awarded to him by President Eisenhower at a ceremony in Washington. There was an incident that did involve radioactive water and injured the crew members, which happened in November of 1960. There were six men that were soaked with reactor coolant water when one man accidentally bumped the valve, releasing the water onto himself and the others. No radiation measurements were ever taken because their dosimeters and clothes were immediately thrown away due to contamination. The Nautilus was docked at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in New Hampshire at the time. There doesn't really seem to be a lot of information from the Navy on the condition of the men or the radiation levels inside the sub. I can imagine at that time period they were a little afraid of publicizing a radioactive accident on board a nuclear sub. But it must not have been too bad because the sub was in operation for 20 more years after the incident. So, Nautilus was involved in another serious accident in November of 1966 when it collided with the aircraft carrier USS Essex, Essex off the coast of North Carolina during war games. Um, no one was killed, but one submariner was seriously injured. The sail area of the sub was extensively damaged, and the Essex had an, uh, had an open gash in its hull. But both vessels made it back to their home ports under their own power. Throughout the 1970s, the Nautilus did various cruises of the Mediterranean and Caribbean seas, um, assisting different naval fleets with anti-submarine training and being a development platform for new sub-technology and tactics. And finally, on April 9, 1979, the Nautilus left Groton, Connecticut on her final voyage. She headed south, passing through the Panama Canal, and headed 
to Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo, California to begin inactive procedures. She was officially decommissioned on March 3, 1980. On May 20, 1982, the sub was designated a National Historic Landmark by the Secretary of the Interior, and after an extensive historical ship conversion and restoration was performed, she was towed back to Groton, Connecticut and arrived on July 6, 1986, where it remains today as a museum open to the public.